Make love, not war. Unless someone bullies me, then I'll unleash a reign of terror to even the score. If you like true revenge stories, you found the best place for your vengeful needs. In this episode, a internet buyer tries to bully and cyberstalk his way into a deal. Threatening a woman and her young child. But instead of getting a bargain, he gets a deal with the devil, ending up with his life mercilessly destroyed. Second story is about making love, not war. But if someone shows up with a batch of war, you'd be rude not to partake. So when a hippie meets aggressive rednecks, and ends up in the hospital. The hippies return the favor with nuclear revenge. Followed by a MMA fighter that gets mad for being forced out of a Uber for being loud and drunk, and answers with his fists. The Uber driver answers back, but he does so with his car. Lastly, a story about two bullies, who like to target people who suffer from panic attacks. Forcing others into terror, for their amusement. Fortunately, they made it to this list, for our entertainment. When you notice the like button sleepwalking, make sure to help it get outside. Then close the door and lock it. Let's dive into it. Naturally, viewer discretion is advised. These revenge acts might be disturbing to snowflakes. My story happened about eight years ago, when I was selling my car. It was a used car. There were some defects, like the engine light that was always on in the display, the AC needed recharging, and the fuel pump or something was out. So I proceed to make an ad and post it on my local trusted sales site. I made sure I'm honest about all defects and name them specifically. Ad goes up with a few pictures and the words. I work weird hours, so I may not be able to accept a phone call, please only text me. Yay to working swings and midnights. Truth is, it was actually college classes, but it's the same to me though. So a few days in, I get a pretty standard text. Hi, I'm Matt. Is your car still for sale? So I text back that it is. A few standard texts followed about price, such as why the engine light is on, where the price quote was from, I listed an approximate price on the repairs as quoted from my trusted mechanic. The next day I get a text from him out of the blue, saying, Are you gonna take all your crap out of the car before you sell it to me, or is that my job? Unwarranted hostility, really? He's not the only interested party, so I text him back. I'm not selling the car to you, so don't worry about it. I never said I would sell it to him, you never asked if he was the only interested party, and others were arranging test drives already. I didn't need him and his less than full price, partial commitment and creepy hostile attitude. This guy didn't like to take no for an answer, and starts calling and texting about how my car's paint is peeling. True with the pics and description said so, and how dare I ask so much. $1,000 for a piece of doo-doo car. I repeated to him that he wasn't going to get the car, that I had other interested buyers, so he didn't need to worry about it. Then things got personal. This site gave you the option to link to Facebook, so you could post at both places at the same time for more exposure. So I did. I didn't have my privacy settings turned down, as it was still early into Facebook's absolute reign, and I actually trusted them at the time. Silly naive me, I know. I hadn't anticipated that he would be able to find my info through the website's post, like my name, location, pictures of my kid, my mother-in-law's obit, etc. Surprise surprise, he found it all. He starts to text me about how I should be ashamed of myself for saying no to him, a muscular dude, me being a quite round female. He included a picture in one text, and he wasn't the muscular built man he claimed to be. He looked like a bin pole with two ab muscles. He asked me if I even knew anything about cars or if I made the post while on my period, therefore not knowing what I was talking about. Like, seriously dude. He texted that I should be lucky I was already married. Or else he'd come to my house and show me how a real man handles a little skank. He tried calling out my address, but since I'm living in a very crowded area, he couldn't get it through GPS location only. Small side info, since I was in college at the time and needed a more flexible schedule, I worked as a school crossing guard. Every two weeks or so, we'd go in to sign our time cards in order to get paid. This crossing guard gig was a hire though my local PD. During one of these visits into the office, I was using my phone while I was waiting for my boss to call for me. I hadn't yet blocked the dude, 
as it hadn't been long since this started, and I was hoping it would fizzle on its own. I didn't check my phone during class that day, so the phone was flooded with all kinds of messages during the day. What I saw on my phone drove me over the cliff. He started texting about pictures I had posted on Facebook about my eight-year-old son. He had just majorly crossed the line. The cleanest version of his texts included things like, Your kid is just as ugly as you are. I hope you don't plan on him leaving home to get a wife anytime soon. And how a smudge of dirt on his face, from a day at the zoo, looked like I beat him. So let's do a recap, I didn't sell this aggressive bully my car, so he threatens to assault me in my house and accuses me of beating my kid. When reading this, I immediately thought out loud, saying, oh hell no. Apparently, I was loud for my boss to hear me, because he stepped right over to me next and asked what was wrong. Great person, 10 out of 10, would boss again. I told her that I was getting this abusive texts from a rando that tried to buy my car. I told her I was about to erase the texts and block him, but she's like, no wait, don't do that. Let me see your phone. Thinking back, I'm happy I didn't delete them, because this next part still makes my heart sore. I give her my phone, and she's reading all the sick and vile things he texted to me that would make snowflakes blush. She tells me to wait until she cleared the lobby of the other crossing guards, so I do. She then tells me to follow her behind the security doors at the PD station, still having my phone. I don't know what's happening but I liked and trusted her. So I go with the flow. I follow her back to her office, where she works on her computer, checking my phone on occasion. She asks if all I have is the phone number or if I got his name too. I tell her I only got a first name, and scroll to the text where he introduced himself. And semi-uncomfortable amount of time later, she hands back my phone. Something to mention, my boss isn't just administrative, I didn't know it at the time, but she's a full-on lieutenant in the local police department. She came up the ranks from patrol, moving to a position where she exclusively investigated child, elder and disabled abuse complaints, before moving into her current desk position. Needless to say, she didn't take people threatening harm to kids lightly. Because I hadn't blocked the number, I still had the text messages with the dude's name, and she had used it to cross-search him and the phone number. Long story short, she knew exactly who he was. She says not to worry, but don't delete or respond to his texts anymore. If it got worse, I should call her or 911 as appropriate right away. Unconcerned and happy she had the situation in hand, I leave and go to class. When I'm back to the office to sign my next time card two weeks later, I had several unread texts from the guy. I had filtered them so I didn't see them pop up and hadn't read them yet. At this moment I had sold the car, for full asking price. And all but forgotten the entire situation. My boss tells me to wait for her again as she had something else for me to sign, and I again return to her office. She briefly explains that she wrote up an actionable complaint that she needed me to sign from my issue two weeks ago. I remember everything all over again. She must have seen, that I was a bit uncomfortable because she tells me not to worry and that she can tell me what's going on, after I actually sign the form. So I do. Dear listener, this is the best situation anyone could have asked for. The phone number tied to many people as the provider was known for cheap cell service, specifically for those that were desperate for a way to contact people or services. But with the name Matt, she was able to find out who was messing with me. She then got a driver's license, which led to her address which led to a police report for possible domestic violence. Fall down the rabbit hole some more, and you find out that this dude had five kids by four women, and he was in arrears on his child support to them all. Hadn't been paying for 10 plus years, and it was in the range of 30 to 50k, if memory serves. But he somehow, just two weeks ago, request a title transfer for a new to him, quite fancy old car. I don't remember the kind, but it was definitely a high-end car used for shows with massive insurance premiums. Being so far in arrears, meant that my boss was able to place a seizure order on the car, so it could be sold to pay back the child support. One of the baby mamas lived in a state, where fleeing child support meant you could have a warrant issued for your arrest. When she called the interested parties in that state, to see if they wanted to execute the arrest warrant, they said. Yes, with much haste. 
That was a funny turn of phrase, so I always remembered it precisely. Some digging and one conversation later, my boss was able to determine that he was using the brother's social security number on his employment forms, to avoid child support garnishments. This is all sorts of illegal, so she notified the guy's HR department so it could be corrected. They informed her he would be fired for fraudulently submitting false documents. She then told me that about four days ago, she had executed the warrant on the dude for felony child abandonment, and that the state he was to be held in was already en route to pick him up. This would carry a 8-12 to 12 year sentence, and he still had to pay his back child support. I could have dealt with the mean comments, I could have dealt with the not taking no for an answer, even dealt with the cyber stalking. But when you're so twisted that you think it's okay for you to bring my kid into the picture, you cross the line. If he would have stopped bullying at no, he wouldn't be in jail right now. This story originated from the guy who got jumped. He worked with my grandfather and also told my dad. My dad passed it on to me, so I want to share it with you now. My dad grew up in Shreveport, Louisiana, just across the Red River is Bossier City, Louisiana. This happened in 1970, and the guys involved were in their early 20s. Also, I have nothing against rednecks, people would even consider me one before calling me a hippie. They just happened to be the bad guys here. There was a popular drive-in in Bossier. A hippie thought it'd be safe to take his date to the drive-in on a Saturday afternoon. But this specific drive-in had an issue, people from specific groups would get attacked. There was this group of rednecks who'd run anyone off from there they didn't want there. And hippies were a big target. Police didn't ever do anything. At this time, this wasn't so unusual. Also, one cop was the father of one of these rednecks. So when this hippie entered the drive-in with his date, they were spotted by this gang of aggressive rednecks. So not long after pulling up in his van, a truck parked behind him blocking them in. The rednecks jumped out and ran up to his van. They dragged him out and proceeded to beat him badly and told him to never come back. He ended up in the hospital with broken bones and bad bruising for several weeks. His girlfriend told their friend group, which consisted of a lot of other hippies, what had happened. When he started getting better, they started talking payback. When he was out of the hospital, he took his girlfriend back to the drive-in in his same van, hoping they'd show back up. They did. They parked behind him again to block him in. The bad guys got out of the truck and started walking his van, they were hollering about how they told him not to come back, and since he did, it was gonna be way worse this time. What they didn't expect, was that the side door was open already. So when they pulled it, they opened Pandora's box, containing 10 aggressive hippies that were piled in there, eagerly waiting with baseball bats and metal pipes. They immediately proceeded to beat on these rednecks. But when I say beating, I mean a real beating. None of them died, but they all end up in the hospital with far worse injuries than the original guy. He learned that some of the injuries ranged from broken noses, broken ribs, severe head injuries, internal bleeding. Let's say they really got him. As satisfying as the revenge aspect is, I found it just as satisfying that the hippies didn't get in any trouble, since the rednecks who started it and had been doing it to others too, didn't get in any trouble either. Also just as satisfying, is the rednecks didn't ever mess with anyone at that drive-in again after that. This story happened where I live and it became news last week, because of how crazy it is. As it is public and on the news, I'll refrain from using the names involved. The revenge victim in this situation, was a MMA fighter and the perpetrator was his Uber driver. I will refer to them as fighter and Uber. That night, the Uber picked up the fighter and a some of his friends in a neighborhood in the suburbs of my city. The group was supposedly drunk and were screaming and making a huge fuss inside the car, which annoyed the Uber. He asked them to stop, which they did for a while, but soon after started again. They kept annoying the Uber, until he snapped. He stopped the car on top of an overpass and told them to get out of his car. This was late at night, so there was no traffic. The group started to get out, but the fighter did not like the Uber's attitude, so he started punching the Uber right before leaving. His friends take him off of the driver and the Uber speeds off. The fighter's group start walking to a nearby gas station to wait for another ride. Meanwhile, the Uber makes it back around and starts speeding back in their direction. The Uber hits the fighter in the back, running him over. From what I heard, the impact alone would not be enough to kill the fighter. But that was not it. 
The force of the impact launched the fighter in the direction of a truck parked nearby and he hit his head on said truck, killing him almost instantly. The Uber sped off, but the driver presented himself to the cops. The fighter had two kids and so did the driver. My story happened like a month ago. These two guys I knew from school, wouldn't leave me alone. So I blocked them on Instagram, phone and Snapchat. They keep trying to reach out to me. When they reached out, they would said things that triggered panic attacks, and they knew this. I've been recovering from an abusive relationship. Since the incident, I have unfortunately gone through some really bad anxiety that I'm trying to overcome, rather than let it control my life, so poop holes like this don't help. So it started when this kid, called Elliot, said I was hot. He tried to hit me up, but I wasn't interested. So him and his friend, called Mason, thinks it's hilarious to try to piss me off constantly. Telling me I'm fat, ugly, my ex didn't really abuse me and so on. I don't know how they found out about that last part. But they did. They just found it funny, they also did this to other people. Even a girl on the edge of suicide I knew. So pretty much, I ignore it and I'm still playing staying nice to them, I may be a girl, but I hate drama and wanted none of it. An important part of this story is that I played on Xbox with their friend, and one time, we were all in a party. They forgot I was in the party and start talking about people, this is how I learned that Mason had nudes of someone I used to be friends with. He had showed these to multiple friends and sent them to his best friend Elliot. I finally came to my senses, I realized the way I was being treated was unacceptable and I knew this guy would leak these pictures, potentially ruining her life. So I genuinely wanted to help her. I anonymously warned her through a fake number. Later that day I get a text on my real personal number. From her boyfriend telling me I need to mind my own business and this is why nobody at the school I used to go to likes me. At this point I'm having an anxiety attack and I'm freaking out, I'm hyperventilating and having a genuine panic attack. I'm feeling terrible, because I genuinely feel like I did something wrong. I was putting myself down and feeling like crap. I felt like I offended them, so I start apologizing and trying to explain my thought process. Turns out, it just these two guys fricking with me. So I'm crying and panicking for no reason. My anxiety turns into rage, as I block their last number they used to contact me with. Let me add that I had them blocked on everything and they kept getting fake numbers. Both Elliot and Mason were blocked on all social media, even TikTok. Well funny thing, one is in possession of illegal images of kids, so I called the school and made sure it was known that his phone contained illegal images of minors. The other, well, he likes to smoke a lot of weed and unfortunately he's under 21 and it's illegal in my state, oops. I have no idea what happened to Elliot, but I heard he was kicked off the lacrosse team and possibly getting a large fine. I heard the other one is on the offender list and possibly facing juvie time, because he actually had lots of these illegal pictures in possession. Thank you for enjoying this episode, which was made with artificial love. Subscribe or give Royal AI some sugar by avenging the like button. Could you imagine doing one of these acts yourself? Share your experience below. I'll join the conversation.